We thank you for the invite. We have Mr. Devashish Roy, Vice President, IT CAC Limited. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us here. Delighted to have you. Thank you, Chiranjeev. We have Mr. Vishal Malhotra, President, Data Analytics, Inspira Enterprise, India Limited. Thank you, Mr. Malhotra, for joining us and most welcome to this session. Thank you, Chiranjeev. Mr. Ravi Kumar, Chief Digital Officer, Excite Industries Limited. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Chiranjeev, for having me. Hi, Mr. Ravi Kumar. Thank you so much for joining. Mr. Barnik Chitran Maitra, Managing Partner, India and South Asia, Arthur D. Little. Warm welcome you. to Mr. Mopo. Uh, thank you, Chiranjeev, for having me. We have Sardar Anmol Singh Narula, Director, JIS Group. Thank you so much, Anmol, for being here. Uh, thank you, Chiranjeev. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. We have uh, Ms. Nadia Bevenkova, CEO of Brain Development Russia. Thank you so much, Nadia. Delighted to have you hey, here. Thank you very much. Hello from Russia. I will come to Mr. Ravi Kumar, Chief Digital Officer, Excite Industries Limited. So, uh, Data appears to be the new currency. Data and analytics are the key accelerant of an organization's digitization and transformation efforts today. According to Gartner, information as an asset is still in the early adoption phase, which makes it a competitive differentiator for leading organizations as they focus on digital transformation. In turn, data analytics have become strategic priorities. Now, given the role that analytics plays in the digital transformation, and the early adoption stage of analytics in every organization, we would invite Mr. Ravi Kumar to throw some light on how he harnessed the power of intelligence and analytics in this journey. He has established digital business models from scratch and turned around IT functions into innovation powerhouses. So my first question for Mr. Ravi Kumar, can you kindly throw some light on how you were able to leverage analytics in the digital transformation journey, given the levels at which they exist in the industry today? Yeah, hi. Uh, so, see, uh, in my opinion, digital transformation is about three things broadly. One is optimizing operations. Second is transforming your offerings. And third is transforming the business model itself. So, data and analytics is the single most important competency factor for all these three. For example, optimizing operations entails use cases like inventory optimization, forecasting, predictive maintenance, and all of these we realize are statistical problems to solve. Similarly, when we talk about transform offerings in organizations, it is about improving customer experience, digitizing the product, or offering your products and services. Again, all of the rely heavily on data, whether it is for customer acquisition, lead conversion, customer service. So, I think the crux is that to do any digital transformation today, most business leaders will rely on data and analytics. And that is why it becomes paramount for organizations to essentially treat data as an asset. And I have used it across these three verticals, as I said, to optimize operations, transforming the offerings, and transforming the business models also. Yeah. Mr. 
Mr. Ravi Kumar, can you kindly turn on your video? I can try that. I am at the airport actually. So okay. Okay. Let me attempt that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Fine. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravi Kumar. I will come back to you after some time again. Uh, Sangram. Yes, Abhi. <coughs> Sangram, while we talk of uh, digital transformations visible to the consumers or where technology meets the end users, there is a lot happening in the infrastructure sectors which drive transformations in a holistic manner. Now, these are the segments which impact our daily lives in more ways than one. For example, smart metering, innovation in the telecom industry, intelligent traffic systems, digital technologies in the mining sector, and so on. Now, digital technologies also play a critical role in uh, developing economies where infrastructure growth is imperative for economic growth. Now, in the light of this, we would like to invite you to speak on my first question. We understand Billasoft is extremely bullish on growth in the infrastructure sectors, which is witnessing and will continue to see growth in transformation as a result of this uh, pandemic. So Sangram, all of us recognize the initiatives of smart cities, smart and sustainable infrastructure, and the technological advancements in infrastructure sector. What in your opinion are the challenges in the execution, given that the projects are either government owned or private uh, public partnerships? Sure. Thanks, uh, CB. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, BCCI for inviting me. And of course, thanks, CB, for moderating this session. Uh, sorry for my sore throat today. Uh, so let me actually start with uh, maybe one step back. Uh, I think all of us understand how important role of infrastructure is. And I think if today all of you are tuned to the news. Uh, the largest expressway from Mumbai to Delhi, uh, Union Minister is actually reviewing the progress. And for the first time, I think uh, some of the milestones are ahead of the time which was a pleasant surprise because otherwise, if you see infrastructure has always been a kind of a growth engine of the country. Uh, so maximum GDP, if you see, is always from the infrastructure sector. And naturally, if you look at the next decade, if you really wanted to grow, and I think I heard the earlier session, three trillion economy and all, if you really wanted to be there, I think uh, this sector has to really perform very, very well. And it's spread across. You spoke about uh, smart cities. I think all of us in India are very well aware where we are heading as a citizen and as well as most of the cities. Maybe we are not actually what we were intended to be. But I think thanks to the technologies like uh, digital or information technology or automation, I think we are trying to maybe bridge the gap whatever we have not able to do. Uh, one of the I think biggest concern I think most of us have that most of the infrastructure projects are always delayed. So it will take more time, it will take more efforts and naturally the more cost to all the taxpayers. And I think that is the biggest pain uh, technology advancement is trying to actually address. Uh, and if you see the Indian trends, uh, it is predicted that by 2030, close to 40% of Indian population will be in urban area. Now, just imagine kind of stress we are going to have on the urban infrastructure. And similarly, close to 75% of our uh, GDP is going to be come from urban areas. Now, these are the actually absolutely very important uh, data point. So unless we really pay attention, to the challenges what we are facing today, I think we'll be still living in the same way. And this is where I feel I think technology is going to add. Uh, already we are seeing the global disruption. Uh, there are shifts happening in terms of the capital availability for the infrastructure projects. Uh, more and more people started talking about social and environmental priorities. So sustainability is becoming an important aspect. And a lot of these digital technologies are getting adopted. Uh, naturally, there are challenges because of again COVID. Uh, for the particular for the infrastructure sector because the government will find it difficult to fund the projects the way they used to pre-COVID because a lot of funds are diverted into some other industry benefits or even for that matter the COVID related measures as well. But I feel I think technology adoption is one key challenge we are anticipating and we have experienced. But whether we are improving, yes, surely. If you, I see last two years, there has been a major progress. And again, sometimes uh, people wanted to thank COVID Ideally, we should not thank, but I think at least for a digital as adoption, I think COVID has really helped. So one is, of course, the technology 
is revolutionizing i think every month every day you will find something new is coming and it is across the industry when it particularly for the infrastructure so take example project management one of the biggest challenge we have come across is uh, the project management though there are a lot of tools available the adoption of tool because of maybe public sector more involvement is very limited the second i think uh, you can see the skills availability uh, as all of us who are is following the it industry as you know the current challenges attrition is at its peak uh, the industry is really struggling to attract the talent because everybody has two or three offers now i think the young engineers or the engineers with the experience they will not prefer to join the public sector uh, because of again the kind of challenges uh, so that is the second biggest challenge third i think uh, lot of cloud adoption is happening lot of digital adoption is happening so cyber security and i think i read somewhere tomorrow you will not be surprised if the uh, toll plazas or the fast tags which government has introduced are hacked by somebody and just imagine the chaos it will create so that is the third challenge i think i am seeing the cyber security the fourth is of course the ownership uh, because of public and private partnership or because of the public more involvement in the i think we anticipate and we have seen the challenge on the ownership uh, somebody need to really own it and push and the last one it has is a lot of regulatory and legal compliances the issues which we are seeing in day to day project but is everything as challenging as it no i think uh, with the emergence of newer technologies and i think uh, we'll speak as we progress and i think uh, ravi kumar spoke about those three different areas and i also agree absolutely with him even for infrastructure as well that's applicable can we really look at modifying the business processes can we look at the modifying the business models and of course the overall experience whether it is a citizen in a smart city or me as an individual i think that is where i think we all need to look at it but i still feel i think uh, this newer technology will help to improve the transparency it will help to reduce the low carbon or the more climate resilient assets and it will also help for the sustainable business model so i think this is where i uh, feel as an organization uh, we are seeing the infrastructure sector thank you thank you so much sangram i'll come back to you again after some time thanks mr devashish roy vice president it csc limited mr roy was uh, instrumental in formulating the digital strategy and leading the digital transformation at csc in fact he was conferred the cio of the year award in dublin ireland in the year 2010 so he led the digitization journey for csc the company's digitization story was so impressive that it won the digitizing india award instituted by cisco and ndtv under the category new age service provider of the year over 300 companies had applied for that award for a utility company to ride on the wave of smacked is an impressive transformation driving the focus on customer centricity mr roy transformed the company with a digital strategy and his existing it team sir can you kindly tell us how you embarked upon this entire digitizing journey at csc thank you chiranjeev and good afternoon to everybody uh, you know we are all passing through an unprecedented phase of life in fact the year that went by as also the ongoing financial year 2122 are possibly the most disruptive years in the history of modern world in fact it was a real litmus test for most corporates across the globe only those organizations who were able to quickly adapt to a new way of working were able to sustain their business operations and remain afloat during these trying and testing times although the post covid 19 era has seen a sudden acceleration in the digitization of several organizations we at csc had embarked upon our digital journey way back in 2014 many of you sitting here are probably aware that csc is a private sector power utility engaged in the business of generation and distribution of electricity to over 34 lakh consumers in the city of kolkata and its adjoining areas chiranjeev as you rightly mentioned 
our digitization policy was built around the SMAC framework, where you know the S in the SMAC stands for social media, M stands for mobility, A stands for analytics, and C in the SMAC stands for cloud. In fact, over the past seven years, we have been consciously building our capabilities around these four pillars. And we have seen the organization reaping immense benefits from some of our digital initiatives. In so far as the social media is concerned, there have been a number of digital initiatives under this vertical. So to start with, we have completely revamped our age-old corporate website and transformed it into a virtual office in that all consumer-related services are now available on the web platform on a 24 by 7 basis. And the consumer is no longer required to physically visit our office, you know, the brick and mortar office for such services. To make our website more user-friendly and interactive, we have introduced an intelligent chatbot named eBuddy, which practically caters to most of the queries raised by the consumers. We are extensively leveraging various social media platforms. CSC has its own exclusive Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter handle for various custom interactions. We have also introduced a very useful customer centric WhatsApp bot, which is gaining traction. Moreover, we are in the process of installing an intelligent voice bot based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. This voice bot would actually sit between our existing IVR and the backend call center agents for attending to various supply and commercial related cases. On the mobility front, CSC's own in-house IT team has developed mobile apps, both on the Android and iOS platform, which has the same set of features and functionality that are available in our corporate website. Also, several employee-facing mobile apps have been developed for facilitating and enhancing the efficiencies of some of our important business processes, such as meter to cash cycle, customer relationships management, and GIS. GIS here stands for Geographical Information System. On the analytics front, Various useful dashboards are generated out of visual analytics tools that we use based on the SaaS and Tableau platforms. There is a huge volume of transactional data that gets generated across the organization. Through a combination of relevant rules and algorithms, we are able to deep dive into the plethora of transformational data and come out with meaningful analytical reports for various end users including the top management, to facilitate them in their decision-making process. Coming to the last pillar of the SMAC framework, which is the cloud infrastructure, it is true that not many power utilities have migrated their core IT applications onto the cloud infrastructure. At CSC, we have so far migrated only a few applications, including our mailing service onto the cloud platform. Given that the cloud infrastructure has matured over the past 15 years since its inception in terms of security, robustness, availability, scalability, and performance, we are now actively exploring the possibility of adopting a hybrid solution architecture, where as part of our business continuity plan, we will use the cloud's infrastructure as a service for our disaster recovery site for our core IT applications as well. In addition to what we have been doing under the SMAC framework, there is a center of excellence within the company, which is continuously exploring ways and means of leveraging emerging technologies under Industry 4.0, such as robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning, virtual reality, et cetera. In fact, we are presently doing a number of POCs, proof of concepts, 
in diverse functional areas of our operations and also evaluating the various use cases of these frontier technologies as applicable to our industry. Just to give you a small example from our organization, we have seen a huge shift from the physical brick and mortar model to the digital platform. We have over 40 cash offices where our consumers queue up to pay their electricity bills. Also, we have six large regional offices where there's a huge footfall of consumers who come for various services such as new connection, transfer of supply, billing complaints, etc. Only a few years ago, the mix was 80-20, in that 80% of these consumers would come to the brick and mortar offices for various services. Post pandemic, we have seen a huge swing from 80-20 to 30-70, meaning 70% 70 of our consumers are now paying their electricity bills and availing of various services through our corporate website, our mobile apps and through other digital channels. There is no denying the fact that various digital initiatives at CSC, which is essentially a 125 years old legacy company, has seen a transformation in the way our business has been conducted today, as opposed to what it was a decade ago. I think this answers the first part of your question. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll come back to you after some time again. We have Mr. Vishal Malhotra, President, Data Analytics, Inspira Enterprise India Limited. Innovation makes the world go round <clears throat> is the buzz phrase in the telecom industry today. All of us uh, have been witness to the constant revolution in the telecom industry and we go over the top to view content over the internet. We have a pioneer in the space who launched the Dito TV, India's first OTT application. It was an integrated system of content delivery, customer analytics, and hybrid cloud infrastructure, consisting of most of the elements of a digital transformation. Customer requirements, experience, innovation, analytics, innovative delivery models, and hybrid cloud infrastructure. With this rich experience, Vishal joined Inspira to lead contemporary IT offerings of cybersecurity, networking, data storage, and smart solution. The pandemic brought in changes in the operating model and work from home became a default option. Recognizing the need for a secure environment, the cybersecurity offerings literally began at home where the customers were able to virtualize their desktop at home. Let me request <coughs> Mr. Vishal Malhotra to share his thoughts on what motivated him to lead this company into the future by revolutionizing digital transformation across the globe. Mr. Malhotra, please. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's quite an extensive question. Um, basically, from my journey and from my experience, uh, the next step was to look at where the data lies, right? And a company such as ours, is, which is Inspira, we've been touching data at the most important point, which is the security. We have access to all the data that uh, you, uh, a general company looks at to make sure that they are secure across the board, whether it's their users, whether it's their customers, uh, whether it's their work um, environment or their or their, uh, uh, their, their environments where uh, their production takes place, right? And the beauty of this is when we looked at it and we said, hey, you know what, there is so much data that is lying over there. Let's create a fabric of information within this because it's all available to us today, right? And what everybody has been uh, echoing over here from Mr. Devashi to Sangram and to Ravi uh, is the fact that we have to look at this data intrinsically and see what value we can derive from it. So this is the journey where we thought we can become a digital transformation company from a cybersecurity angle. And a digital transformation journey, which begins at a cybersecurity level, ensures that we are providing the best in class in terms of secure availability of information and decision making in an organization. So our goal here basically is to look at a, a, a client or a customer and say, hey, give us your data. Let us look at it. Let us secure all that data. 
And what we do with it from there on is provide an ecosystem. Developing the right ecosystem is key to the framework of data analytics because there is a lot of noise that is inherently available in data, right? There's too much data available. I mean, there are too many devices, there's too many uh, uh, systems that are playing at any given point of time, and there are too many tools right now, right? Data is coming in plethora in terms of whether you're looking at it from a point of view of chatbots or you're looking at it from websites or point of sale systems or just general handhelds or your endpoints. The number of endpoints that have increased. I myself, have, a, as a user in an organization, have at least three to four endpoints at any given point of time. So what's the goal over here? The goal is to look at this information and put it together in the best possible manner, right? First, internally, let's make that data clean. Let's remove all the noise from it, make sense for it for the organization that needs to make the correct decision, right? Uh, the, the, the decisions that are to be ma uh, made have to be made in conjunction with the people working in that environment. Then comes the transformation. Then the transformation is that, hey, now let's bring in the external data. Let's bring in the social media data. Let's bring in data from other sources. Um, and let's marry that data and see what transformation actually means for that company. Is there a ubiquitous change that takes place across the board? Or is it that we have only digitized the company? The key part is the innovation that leads to change. Just like in the OTT space where we had uh, Dish TV, we had you know uh, the standard of operating model, which has now completely turned around on its head. It's time to actually look at most organizations and turn them around on their head and say, hey, we've been doing this wrong or we've been doing it uh, inefficiently. Let us look at all those parts of information and make that innovation in, uh, leap forward for uh, the organization. Um, so that into a predictable model, into a scalable model, that is where our strength comes from. And that is what we look at in terms of the future uh, as far as data is concerned. Back to you, Chandan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll come back to you. We have Mr. Barnik Chaitran Maitra, Managing Partner, India and South Asia, Arthur Digital. Barnik Chaitran Maitra is a leading technology expert, having led leading consulting firms as a long-standing partner of McKinsey for over 14 years, having a global footprint in Africa and Asia, India, of course. His experience in the agriculture sector, besides other segments, will provide us a visibility into the potential of digital technologies to revolutionize agriculture. Besides, the recent pandemic exposed us to the shortcomings in our supply chain, especially with pharma products and essentials. Mr. Moitro, with your extensive experience across Africa and Asia Pacific, we would like to hear from you regarding effectiveness of digital transformation on supply chain for foods and medicines. And besides that, the agriculture sector is also in dire need of reforms to improve productivity and better realization to farmers. Do you think digital will have a role to play in the agricultural reforms as well? Over to Mr. Mathur. Thank you, Chiranjeev. So let's speak about agriculture and I'll focus on that, right? Uh, see, agriculture, at least in the context of <clears throat> India and emerging economies like Africa is a prime sector for digital disruption. Uh, it's 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 uh, uh, prime for that for many reasons. You've heard of fragmented land holdings. You've al already spoken about low productivity, particularly in terms of the yield from farms. Uh, there is very poor market linkages. Uh, I would say an informal credit mechanism which doesn't work, and with prohibitive credit charges. And and in general, a system which uh, is very inefficient in terms of supply chain. In fact, if you look at any reports you will talk about 20 to 40 percent supply chain wastages in fresh food, uh, fruit, vegetable, cereal kind of supply chains. Uh, I think so. In terms of reform, I think let's talk of India. I think the three new farm bills or the farm laws, now the farm acts, are a good step forward to actually remove some regulatory barriers in terms of access to market. So that is is a good enabling factor. But we are seeing several emerging use cases across two pillars of agriculture. 
number one let's talk about supply chain i think supply chain is a very important component we are seeing emergence of uh, three or four important use cases number one is uh, end to end digital marketplaces right uh, things like e chopal but several other variants where you have marketplaces where farmers can put up their produce uh, transact sell their produce uh, you are seeing in some uh, parts of india as well as in africa ai driven algorithms which drive uh, route optimization uh, for transport Uh, reducing the uh, uh, wastage and quick delivery and in fact in agriculture the issue is not so much quantity wastage but also value wastage uh, the price you get for a fresh fruit versus a fruit which is uh, delivered to a market two weeks after that is different uh, there is also you know, a lot of uh, marketplaces which are emerging which allows farmers to buy market access services uh, whether it be last mile logistics right even uh, some credit right which is now the next big uh, Uh, i would say a barrier to solve for technology particularly doing credit scoring models for unsecured lending to farmers which again is the next frontier and finally uh, getting some ai based uh, demand predict uh, prediction systems which allow you to allow users of farm produce to actually predict uh, uh, volumes and procurement which makes it far more efficient so that's one very big drive and we are already seeing uh, a few startups and i'll talk about the names a little bit later the second big usage we are seeing is in agricultural productivity through something called smart farming or technology enabled farming uh, there you have a, a sensor or iot based uh, data which uh, actually works on uh, uh, agroclimatic data uh, and other analytics to suggest adequate uh, cropping patterns uh, you have a lot of use of ai and photometry radiometry uh, computer vision for doing uh, seed analysis seed classification seed selection at the same time you have a uh, sensor based uh, work on looking at quality of soil right uh, uh, measuring soil uh, moisture temperature ph uh, in fact there has been a drive in india to create soil health cards right the challenge is the soil health cards are currently physical and very few of them have been digitized but the moment you digitize uh, soil health cards you can then start providing recommendatory advice to farmers on what kind of fertilizers they need how much of pesticide they should use Uh, what is the kind of yield estimation they can have and also manage the entire integrated yield right so these are some of the use cases we see in agriculture i think the good news at least for india is there is a set of startups who are already working on this for example uh, uh, dehart and agri bazaar are two startups i am aware of for doing marketplaces krishi hub is another interesting startup which is doing root optimization ninja cart uh, is doing supply chain optimization okay. on the other side you are seeing uh, folks working on farm productivity right which are uh, precision farming advisory companies we are seeing smart center firms like picno uh, there's crop farm working on farm to business supply chain and agnext which is actually doing work on uh, uh, ai based quality testing for farming inputs so again it's a very vibrant phase i think uh, as the government steps back from regulating agricultural markets and produce as private sector starts playing a bigger role in ensuring farmer incomes i think digital can be the important bridge uh, be, uh, between farmers and markets both from a supply chain point of view but also from a productivity improvement point of view thank you so much thank you so much mr mehra i'll come back to you again after some time we have sardar anmol singh narula director gis group <coughs> anmol Thank you so much for being here, Anmol. Technology yes, is I... playing a critical role <clears throat> in the education sector, especially with the pandemic. This change has been unprecedented, and the impact has been severe, especially in the public education system. Now, mm -hmm. digitalization, digitalization is taking over the education system in a big way, and teachers are being challenged in more ways than one. The question is, how does your educational technologies business? help in the transformation of the education sector and do you have startups to provide the acceleration in this journey now startups today <clears throat> are one of the key drivers to digital transformation and you spend your time equally between india and us and in the startup ecosystem so where do you see the maturity curve of startups in india and their contribution to digital transformation and can you kindly mm -hmm. cite a few examples of innovation fueled digital transformation within your group Yeah so uh, Chenny thank you for having me so 
you know i think uh, it is a pre- slightly premature um, you know statement about the maturity of startups in india because india is just getting started right so in india the customer base for digital transformation used to be much smaller like say 6 or 7 years ago you know it wasn't until jio came on the scene and the data prices and the smartphone prices dropped there did we start seeing a vibrant startup ecosystem come up so as more and more of indians start having access to reliable internet across like tier 1 tier 2 and tier 3 cities and even rural india we saw a sorry um we 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 saw a digital acceleration that is uh, you know uh, going across india and the ecosystem is really developing so but you know it's important to note that uh, sorry give me one second hold on i'm getting me having some trouble um here hello can you hear me yeah yeah you are audible perfectly yeah. audible okay yeah so uh, so the digital acceleration is not just dependent on technology right it, it's also dependent on the people because people are at the center of any digital acceleration and there are two factors that you know really drive uh, digital acceleration one is availability and the second is adoption so availability has to do with the you know the distribution and pricing of uh, the technology while adoption is dependent on the people who are at the heart of this entire ecosystem right you can have the most advanced technologies but without those two elements you cannot see a digital acceleration and consumer trust in these technologies plays an important factor right i'll, I'll cite an example so in the united states when you add your payment details to any say application or a service that you want in order to try a uh, test your payment details what they'll do is they'll debit $1 from your account that later gets reversed in india so in order to build consumer trust startups started to credit a rupee into your account rather than debit it so you know the consumers not technically losing money so they feel much safer interacting with those businesses but coming back to your question about the startup ecosystem and being a driver for um uh you know just in general dis- digital transformation india does have the most vibrant and innovative uh ecosystem right now more than even i would say silicon valley right now earlier india had uh, a big problem with a uh, massive brain drain you know you have all your fancy ceos in the united states now being all indian americans and they all left at the time but today the situation is not the same because indian entrepreneurs have access to the best resources in india itself including capital you know the access of capital has incre- increased immensely plus india also has the raw talent so when you combine that with the entrepreneurial spirit that we have and our system of government you get something that is say unlike china where you know they've been stifling their entrepreneurs in the recent past so right now india's number 3 when it comes to uh, venture capital funding in the ecosystem in the startup ecosystem uh, but i believe this year india might be able to surpass even china when it comes to that funding alone right uh, so in 2020 india received about 13 billion dollars um across all the startups and this year it's by august alone india has received 17 billion dollars so we are already surpassed that funding amount which shows you that yes people are responding to change startups are getting better at what they do there is definitely a, a digital transformation of course which was sped up by the pandemic which leads me to your second question i believe um education which is our primary sector it's very tricky uh, in terms of uh, you know digital transformation uh there are multiple stakeholders involved there are students the parents there's professors there's administrators so you know in order to bring any kind of change you need to have all these parties to be uh on board with it and these are parties with very different wavelengths it's not the same regular relationship between a business and a consumer where you can get your internal organization set up uh chandi bhai you trying to say something No no please continue please continue yeah 
so you know if people don't get on board um it's very difficult to bring about a transformation and people are sticky to um you know their uh, status quo so even if technology makes their life easier it's pretty hard to get people on board um and as previously mentioned by our speakers you know covid as devastating as it has been it has been the tailwind for uh, a lot of technological jump uh, consumers that would have not made the jump earlier are now ready to do that um so for jis for our education business we um started to um you know take our different tools that we had we had a lot of different digital tools but they weren't being used by consumers because there was always an offline option and people preferred using the offline option or it was just you know force of habit so the first thing that we did was we took our admissions which already had an online component to it but we made it completely online because earlier there was an offline comp- component students had to go to the school physically but we completely took that online but you know that just that was just one component we had to make sure that our experience for all our students our professors our administrator was very streamlined so not only did we do that we took the admission process we put it online then we worked on the learning management system which is basically taking your classroom experience and putting it all online because you cannot run classes just based on zoom or google meet which is what a lot of companies were doing or a lot of institutes were doing at the time because um, you know students weren't ready to adopt the learning management systems that were available online so uh, because of um, you know covid consumers or and students were ready uh, to jump on our platform which we had already started before covid but we really perfected that and then also integrated it on the back end with our erp you know and we already had a deep analytics um, model on the on the back end that we tried to sync it with so that you know for each student we could see their individual performance and along with that with also the teachers we can see their performance when it comes to teaching so we've come to a uh, you know a hybrid system almost especially after schools actually open up in west bengal we will be still continuing with the hybrid model which we intended to like 5 years 6 years ago but we couldn't because uh, like i said people are sticky with their technologies even if it um, might improve their lives so since then we've uh, you know come uh, come a long way we integrated our erp as well uh, we started a venture builder platform for our students called ideometer so that allows students to you know uh, raise funding if they want for their innovative ideas and we put that all in this one system so i mean yes so the transformation has been challenging but i think we we've, we've tried hard thank you thank you so much anmol we have uh, ms nadia bavenkova ceo of brain development russia <clears throat> nadia thank you for being here uh, the discussion on uh, digital transformation is incomplete without the inclusion of harnessing talent and creating potential innovators digital transformations have caused a lot of upheaval and shifts in the organization and with increasing anxiety levels and social unrest it is time to focus on human digital so nadia you are doing great work on emerging technologies and building <clears throat> young innovators by skilling them through your educational company brain development building skills for the future computer vision programming robotics artificial intelligence etc are in great demand today now how do you see this growing in years to come and what is the uptake amongst children and do you think this will become mainstream in years to come nadia i understand that you have a presentation to make uh, my request is if you kindly talk about this first question and when i come back to you in the second round that time we would be keen to see your presentation please okay yeah so so nadia that's what uh, i was asking that uh, how do you see this <clears throat> growing in years to come the skills of the future and what is the uptake amongst children and do you think this will become mainstream in years to come okay uh, so uh, good day dear colleagues 
And uh, my name is Babinko Vanadi. I'm a founder company, Brain Development. And uh, my company is so many years, about 10 years, uh, develop and, uh, uh, produ and uh, produce educational complexes for uh, teaching children digital technologies. And uh, what we see near time. So we see that now we work with digital native era. Children are always digital native. So, and uh, uh, one of the priority goals of a person, especially a teenager, is to be successful and earn well. Any child in the modern world understands and knows what modern technology surrounds him in everything. And to become a successful tomorrow, you need to study technology today. So, uh, we believe at a large extent there will be a demand for digital technologies related to the study of artificial intelligence, the principle of work and construction of neural networks, programming for the required languages and programming of uh, robotic microcontrollers, and um, uh, of course, native technologies. It uh, will be mainstream near time. And uh, our task, our project, uh, to give educational institution, educational complexes, equipment and colloquiums and teacher support to help them uh, to teach children these technologies today for future. And we do it now very good in Russia and share our experience in, in other different countries. And can I show my uh, PPT now? Uh, Nadia, I would request you uh, that I let me cover the second round of questions with the speakers. Okay, I'll okay, come okay. back to you. Okay, then okay. you'll get quite some time for the PPT. Okay, so, okay. And, uh, I will come back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And what I need to uh, say about it in Russia, develop atlas of new professions. And the new professions will be till uh, 2030, 2035, near. And we need uh, to give digital skills to children today. So in the future, we um, may um, have um, a good specialist for economics. And um, uh, in the robotics area, in the atlas of new professions, will be designer home, home robots and the specialist who develops and programs household robots and help in the household, designing medical robots, specialist in the design of bio, uh, biocompatible robotic complexes and kyber devices for medicines and, and biotechnology industries, designer neural interfaces by management robots, a specialist who designs control systems for industrial robots through neural interfaces that allow both individual operators and distributed groups to control their processes. Designer ergonomies, uh, developer nanorobots, programmer smart swarms. So, in the range of neural technologies, will be new professions such as coach of mind fitness. A specialist who develops program for the development of individual cognitive skills, for example, memory, concentration of attention, reading speed, oral coding, with the help of special programs and devices. Uh, neuro, uh, neuro habilit, uh, habilit, uh, neurohabilitologist, a specialist who deals with the rehabilitation of people with uh, mental discords. These codes and traumatic brains using uh, um, psychopharmacology, neurofeedback devices. Neuromarketologist, a marketing specialist who uses knowledge from the field of behavior, economics, and cognitive science in his work. Designing, designer neural interfaces, a specialist who develops interfaces compatible with the human nervous system for controlling computers, home and, and industrial robots. And um, 
uh, in the uh, field of artificial intelligence, in the near future will be professions such as designer of artificial intelligence systems, data specialist, information propaganda specialist, specialist in the use of data in machine learning, analyst of robotic processes, digital information manager, developer of integration with uh, artificial intelligence, co cognitive copyright. So, so this is the mainstreams. This is the new professions and our task and uh, task um, uh, in educational institutions to develop digital skills of our children today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nadia. I'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Ravi Kumar, uh, I think uh, you have a flight to catch. So I have a second question for you quickly. Chief Data Officer is a new role today, gaining importance at par with other C-level executives. In view of data becoming an innovation catalyst, centerpiece in enterprise strategy and focus of investment decisions. So Mr. Ravi Kumar, what is the impetus that is required for organizations to bring their attention to this important aspect in their digital transformation, please? Yeah, Mr. Charanji, so, <clears throat> this is a broad topic and uh, I am not very big fan of titles honestly so what I will try to do is I'll try to first briefly cover what does it entail to leverage data and analytics that you asked me in the first question to drive digital transformation so see traditionally data and analytics meant reports and dashboards while if you look at it in the digital era analytics serves a very broad enterprise purpose and it is more integrated into the way people work i'll take one example of a customer journey on an app say for example any e-commerce app there is data that is collected at every touch point what ad did you click? What search term did you use to reach the app? What product recommendations did you consider? And all of this is used to shape the next customer experience online. Right? So this essentially means that data and analytics is becoming very, very complex and an evolved science in itself. And it needs a very new approach. So I'll try to explain this new approach also. There are, according to me, four broad parts to it. The first one is the data collection itself and so-called philosophy of focus on better data rather than big data. So that is the first job at hand for a CDO, right? To ensure that the organization generates the utmost quality of data at a fast pace it typically starts with lot of cleansing and plumbing work honestly reviewing most important business data something as simple as a customer master how do you collect and ensure your customer profiles for instance on an ongoing basis are being enriched updated and ensure that it is consistent across systems once you have the data in shape, the next thing to focus is to build the team and deliver a data platform that helps you ingest, transform, harmonize data so that you have a democratized data environment for everyone to use where they can apply this analytics on top of this data. Now, this is typically given the name of data lake, data warehouse and all of that, right? And it is important to put in governance processes and teams to ensure integrity, accuracy and security of this data. So this is the second job at hand. The third piece is the realization piece. So identifying use cases with tangible examples of how data analytics can drive revenue, profit, customer loyalty, etc. Right. Typically, 
we start with one or two high impact items establish data products in organizations that can help in scaling some of the processes next is the data driven culture change now this is the most difficult piece and the key here is to measure and communicate so both are important so we typically start with simplistic measures like percentage of users adopting analytics in their daily decisions and slowly we move to more evolved kpis like salesman productivity lift in sales percentage what data footprint has external data unstructured data semi structured data percentage of apps that use ai ml nlp and so on one more important aspect is the communication aspect so we need to communicate regularly back the value of these data products or algorithms if you may say back to business to shift the culture in the organization into believing and behaving as if data is an actual asset for the organization then there is also a need to set up an analytics academy to train not just the analytics team but the business users also so mature businesses if you see recognize that data is an important asset that is worthy of management by a senior executive and multiple skill sets are needed in this entire data and analytics transformation there are business roles for identifying use cases and managing life cycle of those use cases then data engineering roles for data governance and quality data scientist visualization experts data security operations and so on and all of this needs a very different management approach one must also appreciate that legacy companies have legacy systems and data environments which need large scale change to adapt to these new ways of working so cdo is expected to do multiple things right uh, both in terms of culturally technically and also at the same time show value very early on so in my opinion a cdo is nothing but a business leader who brings deep digital data and analytics expertise to help transform and grow the business that is how i look at it wonderful thank you so much and have a very safe flight yeah thank you thanks I'll for having me a very good evening to all of you thank you i'll come quickly to sangram uh, sangram uh, i understand that you have taken major initiatives around uh, supply chain management and related applications now there have been serious supply chain challenges during this pandemic and with the agility required in several sectors like uh, healthcare and essentials how would those digital initiatives build the necessary resilience agility and security sangram please sure thank you so much uh, cb i think uh, before i start uh, on the lighter note i was hearing uh, about the designation issue and i just wanted to share an example one of my customer in singapore they have actually renamed the cio to the chief insights officer and now i think we are already going ahead from data to impact insights as well so i don't know where the designations will lead finally but i think that is where customers are already thinking as well uh, which is again a good part for all of us because whatever we are debating it here i think uh, customers are noting and i think thanks to both ravi kumar and uh, i think devashish sir i think uh, they have made my job very much easier because whatever i'm going to talk as a service provider uh, they are already practicing it and actually nothing greater than the examples what they have shown but coming back to your question uh, cv i think uh, if go back one year march 2020 i think all of us were worried when the lockdown was announced right and particularly those the bachelors or the people who were staying away from family just imagine how difficult situation had been and i think thanks to zomato or swiggy or for that matter all other e-commerce applications as well 
and i think uh, there is a joke on whatsapp right what are the sources of food and multiple options people have given and one of the two options student has selected was zomato and swiggy as well i think that's where even the supply chain has evolved that has become like an integral part of our own life but i think i really wanted to thank uh, the overall digital which has really adopted by the supply chain and its supply chain is not only e-commerce right even if take example of manufacturing industry even my procurement or where where it is my quality function or where it is my delivery or dispatch or even service is a part of my overall supply chain and that is where we are seeing the over lot of availability and application of analytics artificial intelligence uh, robotics iot i think iot has played a very very critical role and i can uh, name few areas uh, where we have worked with customer smart warehouse i think by using this smart glasses now these are the normal glasses but we have our own smart glasses now the operations are becoming actually hands free the vendor manage inventory again very very classical example of and the biggest thing example i think all of us have uh, studied or it's about the uh, trace and track as well as the vehicle tracking and the fleet management so whether vehicle location the geo pensing the health of the vehicle the uh, command center the driver behavior i think all that is possible because all those digital technologies are already in place and we as an organization i think are very very pioneer so whether it is transport management logistics management i give one example one of the leading uh, logistics service provider global player we are helping them for all their logistics operation coming on a digital platform uh, so whether it is their container management whether that is a road transport whether it is a sea management i think all that is possible whether that is a uh, transportation management i think we could have not imagine maybe two years ago but i think uh, this is one industry which has really adopted digital by leaps and bounds during pandemic and one of the reason why most of the it company has grown uh, during this pandemic i think this is the only industry which has really shown lot of growth because of digital adoption we as an organization i think take our pride because most of the areas what has been mentioned i think we have already solution now the blockchain all of us i think are still talking blockchain as a concept but i can at least name couple up of my customers they are already adopting blockchain for their contract management uh, and of course they are exploring some uh, other new areas as well and again as i when mentioned e-commerce is a very very classic and very very simple example of adopting digital so whether it is amazon on one hand or lot of other companies and i think devashish roy sir mentioned about moving their entire billing or customer on the website is nothing but a classic application of e-commerce and for that matter you name any logistics company so whether it is fedex of the world or amazon of the world or zomato of the world or for that matter the traditional brick and mortar companies i think everywhere has adopted the e-commerce model because during this when the operations were closed when the oper- people were looking at contact clicks delivery i think e-commerce had come so overall i think i feel uh, uh, see me uh, one the there is a need so customers are accepted when i say customer my customer and when my customers are accepted their customer also accept because i as a consumer i was also looking at an option where i can remotely or digitally log in to order i get a delivery at home i don't have to venture out of my home and the sale of whether it is flipkart or whether it is amazon or whether it is matter so much to our swiggy has really rocketed right six times seven times and that has really seen in the kind of ipos they have come up right why there is suddenly all i think uh, anmol uh, ji mentioned about the startups this is one area you will find lot of startup in supply chain so whether it is a specific area they are addressing the overall supply chain so overall i think uh, i feel as an organization uh, great uh, success for us and we anticipate next 2 3 years uh, similar demand uh, in this particular area great thank you so much sangram thanks sir i'll quickly <clears throat> i'll quickly come to mr devashish roy uh, sir uh, what strategies would you recommend to address the challenges arising out of uh, cyber attacks in the power utility sector yes uh, chiranjeev it is a serious concern uh, you keep hearing about cyber attacks you know every other day and cyber uh, you know c- cyber incidents are uh, increasing at a rapid rate so it is a real concern uh, 
uh, even in the power utility. Uh, see, the IT ecosystem in CSC is not only vast, uh, but very complex as well. You know, now owing to business needs, several of our critical OT assets, when we say OT assets, the operational technology assets, such as SCADA, SCADA is in the heart of our distribution system. DCS, RTUs, numeric relays, the advanced metering infrastructure, the IoT devices. See, all these are embedded in the CSC system. And some of them need to have intersection points with the classical IT network, purely from a business perspective. Now, as you know, this classical IT network, in turn, is connected to multiple internet service providers, thus making our corporate network vulnerable to potential cyber threats and attacks. Now, moreover, ever since our Honorable Prime Minister announced a nationwide complete lockdown from 24th March 2020, we were caught unawares. Being in the power utility business, we had to supply electricity to our consumers on a 24 by 7 basis. What this meant was that all our critical IT services, you know, our billing, our payment system, our customer relationship management system, fault management system, all these IT systems, they had to be kept fully operational during the complete lockdown period. So what was the solution? The IT team of CSC had to rise to the occasion and quickly ramp up our work from home infrastructure by providing remote VPN connectivity to many of our employees across all divisions across the organization so that the business operations could be sustained even during the complete lockdown phase. Now, we just had a few handful of VPN users during the pre-COVID era. But this had to be quickly ramped up to more than 350 VPN users. Now, we realized that with each additional VPN connectivity that we were providing, we were exposing our corporate network and making it vulnerable from a cybersecurity perspective. So the IT team had to ensure that each and every VPN user's device, the end user that was getting access to the corporate network from remote, had to be properly sanitized. We had to ensure that the operating system was hardened, it was correct, it was the current version, and also the antivirus had all the latest patches. So while we took all necessary steps to safeguard our IT assets at the corporate data center end, at the remote end also, you know, these end user devices that are being accessed, we had to ensure complete sanitization. But we didn't stop there. Over and above that, we've introduced a, a multi-factor authentication system, which actually, you know, as you must be aware, uh, the central system generates a random OTP and it is sent to the specific end user after he's authenticated, he's given access. So these are some of the measures uh, we had to take to you know, safeguard our IT assets. Now, under normal circumstances, we have around 3,000 plus end users who access various IT services that run out of our own captive network. And these services are run centrally from our corporate data, uh, data center. Now, owing to a strategic decision that uh, we had taken a couple of decades ago of laying multi-core optical fiber cables along with our own power cables, we have our own robust, high-speed, secure optical fiber network, which connects internally over 220 locations, which includes the corporate head office, the regional offices, the generating stations, the distribution stations, the cash offices, data centers, all of them. Not many companies in the country can boast of a captive high-speed optical network, you know, which is essentially a man. 
So, so this is a secured network internally. However, like I had mentioned before, we have taken multiple internet connections from multiple service providers, which does pose a threat. But what we have done is uh, we have, wherever it was necessary, we have installed firewalls, we have configured them properly, intuition, uh, intuition detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, all of them are there to safeguard our IT assets. We are also in the process of setting up a sophisticated security operation center, a SOC, to monitor all our north and south traffic so that we can proactively take remedial measures before a cyber attack takes place. That's it from my side, Sibi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we have about uh, 15 minutes. I'll come quickly to Mr. Vishal Malhotra and uh, Mr. Barnik with my uh, second round of questions. And then we'll uh, keep a few minutes for uh, Nadia's presentation. So, uh, uh, Mr. Malhotra. Yes, Ibi. Can you kindly uh, give us an idea about uh, Ankios, this next gen digital transformation platform from uh, your organization? Oh, uh, very simply put, what we are trying to do with our data over here is create um, a platform which allows you to, in a multifaceted way, allows you to connect into all the devices and all the information lying within your system, make sense of that in real time, and give you the dashboards. Uh, that are required for a particular business. So to give you an example on what we did, uh, we were working with um, uh, one of the largest windmill turbine uh, companies in India. What we were able to do is bring in the SCADA data into this little platform, merge it with the data from the Weather Bureau and give them the optimum output for that particular turbine and also give them the health of the turbine uh, in real time. Um, this was a very interesting uh, start of the project of Ankios. Ankios itself actually was born out of this uh, quick development that we did uh, uh, for uh, this particular company. So what we want to do going forward under the Ankios brand is actually productize and move forward in terms of a modular approach to data uh, as far as our analytics practice is concerned. Back to you, CB. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Malhotra. Uh, Mr. Bardik Chitran uh, Moitra, I have a question for you, please. Yes. This pandemic has brought about a shift in the healthcare delivery model, and there is a disruption in the healthcare services and products. There is a huge amount of digitization uh, in the health industry and scope also for a lot of innovation. So what would be your thoughts on how digital transformation can impact the healthcare and patient care services, please? Yes. So I think the uh, pandemic has already brought a big transformation in healthcare delivery. There is a big push towards what we call as at-home services, right? And, and even in India, if you see today, a, a lot of tests can be ordered online. People come and collect samples uh, from you at home. Uh, uh, they then process the test and you get a WhatsApp message with the report, right? So in general, I think uh, uh, everyone has now geared towards a, a new model, which is centered, which is far more decentralized and where digital plays an important role in, uh, our, I would say, uh, uh, driving that entire customer experience. And there are four broad areas where we have seen use cases. One is clearly uh, connectivity and accessibility. This is things like digital diagnostics, right? Uh, or at-home diagnostics, digital health records, the entire uh, uh, impetus towards telemedicine, right, which was completely absent pre-pandemic, but you see a lot more telemedicine consultations. The second is the entire intersection of digital and IoT and patient monitoring. You're seeing more wearables. In fact, now the latest Apple iWatch can even give you an ECG if you want one. It can give a trigger to your healthcare provider uh, and, and, and more and more handheld medical applications. Uh, there is also increasing use of what we call AI into decision support, right, for uh, recommendation engines of what to tell people to do next in terms of the diagnostics business. 
people believe that you can ultimately use ai to even read scans but i think we are a little far away from getting to a point where this works right but in general digital has pushed the drive towards what we would call a value based healthcare more micro payments an architecture which works more towards at home care and i think the good news in india is that you are seeing a lot of ecosystem of this so we are already aware of practo and e and pharmacy right which are the biggest uh, uh, players in their respective spaces like telemedicine e pharmacy but what is more interesting is is other players right if you look at portia right it's a bangalore based at home diagnostics company uh, i think they are driving a big drive towards providing critical care at home uh, for for elderly who need it there's digital uh, therapeutics through platforms like well wellde uh, there's med synapse which is doing tele reporting of radiology scans and then there are lots of uh, providers who've come on board who do molecular testing like i genetics oncostem which does ai based models on diagnostics so again it's a very vibrant ecosystem health tech uh, in india is going to be one of the biggest drivers of investment over the next decade just what fintech and and saas has been and again in general uh, not only is the model ripe for disruption the disruption has already happened and the pandemic if any has actually moved the healthcare delivery model probably 5 6 years ahead of its time than we have ever pre pre pandemic back to you chiranjeev thank you so much thank you so much i'll come uh, quickly to nadia so yes. nadia uh, in the current times with so much of disruption in the industry due to digital transformations uh, fueled by the pandemic there is a need to build uh, resilience now the focus of the practitioners is centered around technology and the human angle is often overlooked we would like to understand how neurotechnology is used in digital transformation and the overall impact on the success of this transformation so nadia we actually have 9 minutes to close uh, kindly allow me to conclude in one or two minutes so before that i would request you to run through your uh, presentation in the process i'm sure this question also would get answered so we have about 6 to 7 minutes for the presentation over to nadia please okay thank you very much yes uh thank you for your questions and i want to tell some words about our technologies and answer your question uh so our company uh about 10 years of work uh, working in the market and develop different educational complexes uh, to teach children digital technologies and uh, near times we uh, we uh, obtain uh, award solutions for sustainable development goals award 2021 breaks for quality education and now more than 70000 children work in this us and more than 8000 educational institutions so in the many countries now de uh, develop uh, programs uh, for digital technologies and the new technologies artificial intelligence is uh, mainstream now and uh, we need to uh, solve problem with uh, educational purposes and uh, to provide our educational institutions programs and educational equipment So in Russia now we work with the schools universities uh children techno parks quantoriums it groups and so on because very many times our government paid for uh early profitential young children in the digital technologies and we have experience in the um, this field and uh, teach um, and prepare teachers to the this and the uh, neuro technologies now is the mainstream as extra education after school education among children and we prepare uh, school school teachers to work this uh, technology this uh, our equipment and uh, this mainstream this e last years from pandemic time and uh, children uh um uh use it and uh, working with robotic system and artificial systems and they work with uh, uh young children and with children with disabilities because children with disabilities need to track the digital technologies too it's 
very, very popular now in Russia. So, and many camps and extra, uh, extra educational institutions now work with us. And we provide three main technologies, mainstream robotic neuro in, and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, robotic kids is a kids for two years old. And our children uh, may um, uh, program in robots and log system and uh, in uh, languages such as C++ and Python. And we use uh, controllers for robotics that we produce and develop ourselves and uh, programming in C and Python. And neuro technologies now, as I said before, is very popular because it will use in medicine and games and sport and military technologies. In new professions will be, uh, will be with these technologies. And uh, we use uh, special equipment such as neuro uh, neuro physiologist engineer. This is a neuro interfaces with dry electrodes and electro headset with working bio signals from heart and skin. And our children may uh, uh, study uh, and neuro physiology of human and working with bio signals and transmit these signals. Uh, the signals to the robotic systems. It's very, very hard, but it's very functions. And the skills that they may obtain in this slide, you can see it's exploring the field of neurophysiology of human and the, uh, study bio signals and knowledge uh, and the structure and the um, constitution of human skin and heart and so on. And uh, to back your questions, Neurophysiology is that through that is there are used particularly in all areas. The main direction, of course, is the medicine. For example, neuro charts, neuro prosthetics, control of prosthetics with the help of brain signals or EMG signals. But even now, neurotechnologists go out of the usual frameworks and they used in ordinary life. We don't even notice it. Now, the same fitness bracelet came from medicine, and now it's used in ordinary life. Because of neuropiloting, that is the control of objects by helping signals to the human brain, neuro gadgets are already used in sports, developed by special neuro interfaces that help to correct cognitive processes. With the help of neuro interfaces, it's possible to recognize the emotions of a person and use them as a means of recognizing fatigue, anxiety, and stress. It, it's very, very uh, important to this time, and we need to prepare our children to these professions and to these technologies today. So, uh, and... Uh, um, our new development is the educational equipment to, to study children from 12 years old, old, 12 years old. It's very young children to artificial intelligence. Yes, in Russia now is a trend to study artificial intelligence, not from students, not from universities, but from school. Because we understand that in the near future, we need uh, to get to obtain good specialists in this range. And this model may uh, to de determine and um, uh, about 1,000 objects and uh, to recognize emotions, people, and uh, uh, to recognize text and uh, so on. And children may, uh, from our model, to study neural networks and uh, to do robotics um, objects governed by artificial intelligence and to create own own programs in special software to create own own neural networks and uh, this is very very advanced educational equipment with colloquiums uh, for children from 12 years old so i want to show you some video file N nadia uh, okay. uh, Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We actually need to close in one minute. Okay. So, uh, okay. Can we expedite, please? Yes, yes, I, I finish. So, okay. 
So, so, and uh, what we, uh, what uh, I, I want to say is that um, to study digital technologies now it's very important, and it's uh, digital skills and digital transformation uh, educational process, and we need to help our educational institutions to uh, to um, start uh, do lessons for digital technologies and to prepare our new generation to the future. And our company uh, may help and the Indian market and, and other countries and share experience, very advanced Russia experience to do these lessons and prepare future education in your, uh, your country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we would like to conclude this session on digital transformation. Our sincere gratitude to each one of our esteemed speakers for this insightful exposition on the various facets of digital transformation. There have been far reaching impact on customer interactions, skills and talent development, product offerings, digital adoption and change management. It has been a technology revolution and the pandemic has accelerated the adoption. According to IDC, the global investment into digital transformation is set to grow at a compound rate of 17.1% per annum, reaching $2.3 trillion by 2023. To summarize, a journey of a thousand miles begins with this single step. To organizations who are yet at the periphery, this is a call for action to rewire your organization and work on your digital strategy. The time is right and the moment is now. Our sincere gratitude to our audience as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all our speakers, audience who have joined us. So we are concluding this session here. Our next session will start at 5.40 p.m. IST. It's a very interesting session, Building Nation with Technology, focusing on economy and social capital. And we have two iconic speakers with us, Mr. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, Managing Director and CEO of Bandhan Bank and past President of the Bengal Chamber, and Dr. Sanjaya Baru, Writer, Policy Analyst and Economist. The session will be moderated by Mr. C. N. Raghupati, Senior Advisor, Infosys Limited. Join us back at 5.40 p.m. IST for Building Nation with Technology Focusing Economy and Social Capital. We are closing this session here for Facebook. We will relive again. For the other platforms, it will continue. Thank you.